Hi, this is Dr. Russell Lonser. Uh, I am chair at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Russell Lonser, chair of neurosurgery at Ohio State. Doc, how are we doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So, you know, getting started, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how those changed during your chief year? So I think, you know, during residency, I, it was to learn all the facets of neurosurgery, uh, first and foremost, because that's the most critical thing, whether you're in private practice or academics. And I think as you develop as a trainee, it was really what did I enjoy most within neurosurgery doing and what could I see myself doing for 30 or 40 years after finishing, I think, you know, as a resident during the first formative years, you're really thinking about how do I get through this? How do I, you know, get the day-to-day -day work done? And then as you develop, you really become more interested or more concerned about what you're going to be doing um, in the long run, because, you know, you, you, the surgery itself will become very routine in many respects um, over time. Not that it's not challenging, or um, you don't need to remain absolutely convicted to it, but doing things hundreds and thousands of times over and over again. So you really, as you mature into that uh, chief year, you're really looking at what do I want to be doing for the rest of my career? So kind of taking us through that chief year for your situation, you know, what was your mentality getting into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Yeah, so, you know, I, I did an infolded fellowship in research and tumor uh, surgery with Ed Oldfield of National Institutes of Health during my residency. That, along with my mentors at the University of Utah, where I trained, was very, it left an indelible mark on what I wanted to do. I found that I was uh, very passionate about doing, uh, 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 studying neoplasia syndromes like von Hippel Lindau disease, neurofibromatosis type 1, neurofibromatosis type 2. Uh, those types of things were fascinating to me from an intellectual standpoint, as well as a surgical standpoint. And so while I was doing that during residency, that really changed my view on what I wanted to do and to be really, really laser focused on the very specific things I was interested in. And that was not just, you know, from my mentorship at, uh, by Ed Oldfield at NIH, it was mentors like Ron Applebaum, Peter Heilbrunn, Jack Walker at University of Utah who were very convicted to a focused uh, practice. And I think that served, it served me exceptionally well as I was developing an academic career as well as a surgical career. But I think that was really, um, it, it, it showed the understanding and forward thinking that those uh, mentors had for me because we are seeing super subspecialization now in the field and it served me well you know, over the years. So in those beginning years, now, what would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your career as you climb the ranks of the academic world? I think it goes right back to number one. And I think this drives anything is being passionate about what you're doing. Decide what you want to do in the specialty and subspecialize in that area. Really focus in on that because that's the enjoyable part of every day. Um, that uh, subspecialization allows you to become an expert in that area very rapidly rather than being my biggest concern with when we have young faculty or our residents going out and graduating is they're being too diffuse. They want to do spine. They want to do a little cranial work. They want to do very different things that don't tie to their academic goals, nor do they tie to their surgical expertise. You know, um, And I think those are, the, those are absolutely critical things, but you have to be first and foremost passionate about what you're doing. Neurosurgery is such a broad field today endovascular and open vascular is very different than spine surgery, which is very different than cranial tumor surgery, which is very different than neuromodulation or functional uh, neurosurgery. So I think it's you know, really starting to decide what you want and love to do, because that's the only thing like any field that's gonna keep you um, engaged every day. Can you briefly take us through your journey and how you became a chair at Ohio State? Yeah, so you know after I, um, did my infolded fellowship in uh, tumor and research at the National Institutes of Health, came back, did my senior uh, at, or in chief years at the University of Utah, um, decided I really enjoyed what I was doing um, during my research time at the National Institutes of Health. There was an opportunity there, went back, um, was able to do exactly the types of cases and things that I wanted. I was fortunate. 
I think that's a big part of anybody's uh, career maturation and decision making. It's there's some luck, but it's also being able to be flexible in where you go institutionally and geographically. And um, so, you know, that's that's how I started. While I was there, um, was able, you know, with great mentorship there as well as in training, to uh, really develop the academic interests, remain focused on those academic. Uh, interest at the same time became involved with um, national neurosurgery, particularly the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, uh, was able to kind of do that, but it was always tied to what I was doing um, in my practice. Um, several years after I got there, um, Ed Oldfield um, went down to the University of Virginia, and, that, uh, and during that transition, I became uh, chief of the neurosurgery group um, at the National Institutes of Health. That, and I was probably 39 at the time, um, that uh, allowed me some leadership opportunities at the, the institutional level um, to develop at a, at a younger age. And um, that was very formative in you know, uh, moving forward and then interacting with other faculty and trainees there. Um, after doing that for several years, the opportunity at Ohio State came up. Um, it was a little, it's obviously a different practice and I wanted that variety. I mean. At the NIH, it's, it's a spectacular place um, that is federally uh, run. It has a lot of advantages and has some of the oppor you know, opportunities in that space. But to come out to a state institution and a large state institution like Ohio State really gave me the opportunity to develop and leadership and other things in a, in a very different way than was, was at NIH. Both places are phenomenal. And so that's, you know, that was over a 20 year arc and um, wouldn't have changed any part of it. Enjoyed every, uh, you know, every place has its challenges, but I wouldn't trade a second of it. Now, as the leader of the program there, what advice do you have for the chief presidents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Yeah, that's a really critical question that I think sometimes is missed in neurosurgery. Um, I think it, particularly for graduate chiefs as well as faculty and chairs and program directors, it's really essential that probably two or three years before you uh, enter into your chief year or before you graduate, you start to engage your faculty mentors, your chair about job opportunities. Uh, you're the leaders within your department, not, and that doesn't, that's not just the chair by any means, really will be critical drivers in what you're doing um, nationally and where you'll get a job. Whether it's in private practice or academics, it cuts both ways. Um, oftentimes you'll have mentors in your subspecialty that will be uh, critical to helping you with that, but your chair, whether they're in your subspecialty or not, will also be an instrumental driver. So start the communication with them early. Start it with them when you're, you know, thinking about fellowships, you know, three or four years before you're done, as I mentioned before, because that will be actually absolutely critical and they can give you great advice. They, remember, they've spent years, decades at times making mistakes, learning uh, different systems because that would be essential. Some of the things that on the surface you may not detect as a new graduate, um, but you'll be um, uh, in tune to by talking to a mentor will be essential and may it, it probably will change the scope of your career trajectory in many cases. As we dealt with the pandemic in 2020 and also in 2021, what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding the networking and outreaching process in a virtual world? It's tougher now with the pandemic. I will you know, it's, you know, it's unfortunate the graduates from last year and this year, they're in a very different environment. A lot of what we do, like in any business, is we, we meet people face to face. We're social animals at the end of the day. The pandemic's been isolating. It's been alienating. The interviews aren't normal. We don't get the, you know, full understanding of the body language of the individual, nor and that's vice versa. Um, I, you know, I think the critical pieces are really being, very focused on what you're bringing to the table for that program. I mean, we are interviewing researchers, clinicians, and surgeons every year. The thing that we lose on Zoom, because Zoom condenses interviews down to uh, a fraction of the time we used to do this with surgeons, where we'd have them out for a day or two, where they're interviewing, where there's multiple points of interaction at dinner. At least those are no longer occurring. So graduates in this era have a very limited amount of time to really sell themselves to the program, the program, vice versa, have a limited amount of time to sell themselves to the candidate. So it's essential you have a really drilled down synopsis of what you are, what you want, because programs don't want to 
take a surgeon that that's not going to be a good fit and, and and like i said vice versa for the candidate so i think but saying that even when the pandemic ends we go back to a more normal state i don't know if it will ever be exactly the same it'll be essential to really say hey here's what i am as a surgeon here's what i want to do here's my career aspirations um, and be able to do that within five minutes, in essence, you know, to lay that right out so that the conversation can occur. It's more essential today than it's ever been. Now, on the topic of interviews and you being the chair, what are you looking for? When medical students are applying for residence spots mm -hmm. and then residents are applying for fellowship spots. So from the medical student side, in residence side, interestingly enough, it's probably the same. First and foremost, we want individuals that uh, will get along in the program. There's nothing more um, disruptive than someone that comes in and uh, doesn't work well as a team member. So we're looking for those social cues, those types of things of someone that can work well as a, as a team member, but also can lead when the opportunity comes up. Probably very similar to a sports team. You want individuals that will uh, work with the team, um, sacrifice for the team, but when the, the opportunity comes up and it's necessary, that they'll lead the team. Um, those are really essential features. We transition, you know, so that's the medical student and the fellow. When we transition to looking at a fellow, we want to make sure that individual um, can, um, has all the skill set to operate, is comfortable in the operating room. Because when you're a fellow, we're not, we're looking to only train you on the nuances of surgery, to take you to that next level of surgical care, not to be um, in a situation where we're uh, retraining or training someone in skills that um, maybe they haven't developed as much. Our expectation is they can function as a fully trained neurosurgeon. We're here to not only fine tune those skills, but to provide academic outlets uh, for them during that year. And not only do that, kind of teach them about the business of that subspecialty, whether it's spine, skull base, tumor, vascular, neural modulation, functional epilepsy, those things. We're, that's what we're really looking to do get those individuals out so they hit the ground running as an expert. Thinking about the human element to being a neurosurgeon, you know, what type of advice would you have given to your younger self when dealing with complications or not ideal situations in the OR? They're gonna happen, um, manage them, manage them completely honestly. The only way you grow as a surgeon once you're done is you know, when those things happen, look, the best surgeons are the most introspective surgeons in those scenarios. That's just a must. You won't grow unless you're willing to look in the mirror um, look and take a deep dive, be your hardest critic when those things happen. But also once you uh, sort out what happened and how to change it the next time, to be able to emotionally put that aside and, and move on so that you can do, you know, continue to grow. And, but it's really that self-introspection and honesty. Now this is something pretty cool with the NFL. Can you talk about your involvement and what you actually did with them? Yeah, so I worked with a, Great group of surgeons, um, uh, Mitch Berger from UCSF, Hunt Bajer from uh, UT Southwestern, and Rich Ellenborger from University of Washington. Um, we worked together for a decade. Uh, we looked at some of the complex issues, issues around concussion. Um, you, know, uh, you know, Rich, Hunt, uh, Mitch were really instrumental in a lot of the rules changes that exist today. And you know, around, you know, moving the kickoff forward, defenseless players, all of those things that have really kind of changed the NFL in a good way. Not only that, it was a science around concussion. It was a science, uh, you know, evolving the science around helmet design, those types of things. Yeah, it really speaks to where neurosurgeons, not just in sports, but in a whole variety of areas, including the pandemic and how we're understanding stroke and things like that can really have impact. And that's why I think neurosurgery is the most exciting field in medicine because we touch on a lot of areas um, in public health, global health, um, for example, as well as what we do in the operating room. So that was a very rewarding experience um, for uh, a decade. Um, that I would, you know, again, one of those things that I wouldn't ever uh, change or uh, do any, you know, differently. Like, like throughout my career, is, you know, I feel in many times incredibly fortunate um, to have great mentors and end up in, you know places that I really enjoy being. So a few years back, you were the president of CNS. I'm just curious, what initiatives are you still excited about? And also what resources are you providing to the next generation of surgeons? 
So, you know, that I'll tell you, it, that's really about research and what neurosurgery can do in research. And that was my presidential talk is how research may evolve in neurosurgery over the next few years and decades. And it really, you know, we're really living in a super exciting time in medicine and particularly in neurosurgery where neurosurgeons um, can have a really transformative role that really outstrips the size of our specialty. We're a small specialty in medicine. Uh, yet our impact is so much larger than the number of individuals. And I think that's going to be in the research space. We've got to remain convicted to the innovation, the transformative things. Uh, we can really have change uh, our patients' lives in ways that um, were never possible even 20 or 50 uh, years ago. And um, so I'm super excited about that. And that was really kind of the theme of what I wanted to convey during my presidency there, my presidential address. Um, you know, I'm super excited about the, you know, our colleagues in the field in private or academic practice. Um, they're doing things that are just remarkable every day. Um, this is, you know, sometimes uh, it, it's not as discussed as often, you know, as it should be around, you know, career development, things like that. As you leave, what, you know, things as simple as if you're an academic neurosurgeon, what type of research space, what type of things do you need in that space to be successful? Um, you know, what are the types of things in the day-to-day? -day? And that goes for private practice as well. Um, it, it's, it's getting into the right place, the right practice, because as you're coming out, you're going to need mentors in either scenario and in, in, in scenarios where it's blended, where there's a private demic type situation. So these are really critical conversations that are occurring and need to occur more and more. If the environment's more complex today than it was 20 years ago when I came out, for sure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.